Hi, I'm Dave Rupert. I, uh, I work at Paravel. Uh, it's a three-person agency based in Austin, Texas, the best city in the best state and the best country in the whole world. And uh, so we're going to get started. Uh, this is a story um, about unblocking your, your backlogs. But the story starts, uh, the story starts here. Uh, one day, hundreds of JIRA tickets showed up in my inbox. My, I was working, uh, I think it was a Wednesday, uh, then all of a sudden, ding, 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 ding. My, my email client was kind of just popping off. It was going amazing. Wow, it's very busy. Uh, and I didn't know what was going on. Um, I thought there was a mistake. I thought I literally was like, ah, there's a glitch in the, the JIRA and <laughs> somebody made a, made a big oops and now I'm getting JIRA tickets. Uh, so I emailed the, uh, scrum master who, you know, I didn't really like at the time, but Hey, you know, that's uh, that happens, you know, but you have to do that sometimes. So emailed that person and, uh, their response was, Oh, I thought you knew. And that was, uh, well, that triggered my fight or flight response. To be honest, I, I was in shock. Uh, I, I didn't, I, this was like an amazing amount of work that just showed up on my desk and, you know, <laughs> my amygdala was, was triggered. And so I, I just, you know, I, I, on the, the fight side of my brain, you know, it was saying, Hey, you like accessibility. You created the accessibility project, a 11 Y project.com. Uh, you care about accessibility. What a great opportunity to make a big impact on a site that millions of people use each day. This is a great opportunity. But the flight side of my brain was saying, this is terrible. No one actually cares about it. Uh, everyone's just going to undo your work later. Uh, you need to get out of there. And, you know, the, the, the flight side of my brain wasn't wrong because some simple math told me, you know, it was like, uh, what, 313 issues uh, divided by, I don't know, I was doing about five issues per sprint, you know, like as like getting sailing all the way through QA, I could do more, but like sailing all the way through QA. Uh, and then that would end up being about 63 sprints of my life, which equals about two years of my life would be dedicated to unblocking this backlog. And I realized like we had created a log jam. I mean, not me personally, because I don't write bad code, right? Like I, <laughs> I don't write bad code at all. I have never introduced an accessibility error, but it's possible. Maybe it's possible that I did. I don't know, but like, I don't do that typically, but, you know, but as an organization as a whole, you know, we maybe created a, a problem in, in, some technical debt and along the way. So while I'm going to get into to this, um, you know, maybe, maybe just a little refresher course on like log jams, the like actual physical log jams, you know, log jams, you know, uh, are pre-industrial days. Uh, loggers are smart people. They realize, yo, I can actually like save a lot of time and energy. If I go upstream, chop a, a tree down, roll it in the river, send it down the river and, and then get it out at the bottom. I don't need oxes. I don't need uh, steamships. I don't need trucks or wagons or whatever. I just like, I can chop it and use the river as a machine. And this works, you know, pretty good. You can send quite a bit of material down the river. Uh, everything goes pretty great. The problem is if you chuck too much inventory into the stream, into the river, uh, they start bumping into each other and going all cattywampus and crashing and they end up uh, causing, and then when they hit a constraint, right? When they, they hit like a bend in the river or a sandbar or a rock or something, that's when they jam up. And uh, th then you have no logs going down to the river, down to the mill. And in some ways, this echoes the theory of constraints in business parlance, right? Like the, and the, you have inventory that through some operational expenses turned into throughput, which is cash. And this theory of constraint was uh, popularized by Eli Goldratt uh, in his book, The Goal, uh, which is a book that I would say never judge a book by its cover. Uh, in fact, never judge a book by what's inside of the book either, <laughs> because this book is, it's a business book and it's told in a narrative format. And that's usually a disaster for business books, but it is act, it actually plays out as pretty good. But if this 
cover is so appalling to you, then I could recommend uh, there is uh, a, a graphic novel that you could use. Uh, the, this is a pretty good graphic novel. I own it uh, and I've read it a couple of times. Uh, but then there's also the Phoenix Project, which is a modern adaptation of this story uh, in, and it's made for uh, DevOps and IT specifically, which is kind of the work that we do. It's actually a really cathartic read and I'd recommend it like wholeheartedly. So, uh, so going back to the theory of constraints, right? So you have inventory, you pay for inventory, you paid somebody to just chop down trees and chuck them in a river. Operational expenses are going to be your milling, uh, your saws, your gas for the cars or the cranes or whatever. It, and actually, even time on the river is an operational expense because uh, time is money, right? So in, if you have a block, backlog and the logs are stuck in the river for 10 days, well, that's 10 days you're paying people to work, but they can't do work, right? And throughput is the work where you get money. And I was looking at this and I was, I was kind of realizing like this is sort of a similar situation with bugs in my own backlog. In some ways, like a bug's life is very similar, right? The bug exists in the code base, right? The bug just exists. And then we discover the bug and we chuck it in the river. And then there's this magic point, the triage, right? Where, where we go through the backlog and we turn that into a ticket or whatever into something that can be worked on. And then it's assigned as well, but then that work is performed and that bug is fixed. And I realized like, oh, this is kind of it. Like if you chuck too many issues in the backlog uh, in the roadmap or whatever, and then something goes wrong, boom, you hit a jam. And I know what you're thinking. This is that, this is a talk about the no backlogs thing I've heard about from the uh, David Heinemer Hansen's and the uh, 37 signals, no backlogs. That's the answer, right? Well, you wouldn't be wrong. Like from a theory of constraints perspective, like that's actually a pretty legit idea. Just like never put too many things into the machine, like optimize for your throughput, never put too many tickets in the machine uh, unless you can do them. There's also some interesting economics, right? Like it's very cheap to file a bug, but very expensive to fix a bug. So now you have like a disparity there, right? It's very cheap to come up with a feature idea, but very expensive to implement a feature. So you have to think about that. Like, like that's very like astute if you're starting to think this way, but I couldn't just delete my backlog, right? I can't go walk into an enterprise organization and just command A and delete the whole thing, right? Like I can't do that. Uh, I had I was in the job of undoing the backlog, right? And so this is how, like we get back to this old question, right? Like how do you eat the proverbial elephant? How do you do it? Well, conventional wisdom says one bite at a time, right? Just get to eating, not gonna matter, but my perspective, like I've never eaten an elephant before. Are there more delicious parts? Does elephant have bacon? Uh, is there good parts of elephant and bad parts of elephant? I would like to know this about elephant before I just start to eat the whole damn thing. So this is kind of where I uh, sort of disagree with the age old wisdom. Uh, rather than just starting like nose to tail, like I'm kind of interested, are there, are there easier things to where I could get into this new hobby uh, with, without uh, kind of uh, going, losing my mind or, or whatever, kind of just, just kind of wearing down my spirit really. Um, so it, it's good to first take a break, right? And understand how accessibility audits are performed. I'm talking about accessibility audits and specifically, but you might have another kind of audit, like whatever security compliance audit, or uh, you could have dozens of different things uh, or, or even just a big gnarly backlog, but let's talk about accessibility audits and how they're performed, right? So they're often done by experts. And, and I say this, I don't wanna change the accessibility auditing thing because they do a good job but they're often done screen by screen, button by button, requirement by requirement, browser by browser, platform by platform. It's very thorough work. And you know, you, you get into this and, and it's a lot of work, but, uh, and I'll show an example later where they found 90 issues on one single component uh, of a site. One single component, 90 issues. That's 33 different WCAG violations, eight different assistive technologies were used to test this work. This work's done by experts. I don't want to change that. But remember, the goal is to eat the elephant. So like, how do, how do we do that, right? So 
One limitation of accessibility audits is they're often focused on the output and ignorant of the input. And I mean that in the most benign, uh, uh, like, like nice sense of the word, uh, because they should be focused on the output. They should be like looking at the output, like what does the screen reader read? Or what does the braille reader read? Is this operable through like a keyboard only? They're, they're focused on the output, but they're often ignorant of the part I work on, the input, right? And if there was just a one-to-one -one mapping between this page and the output, the input and the output, that would be great. My job would be easy, but I've decided to make my job more complicated. So I actually operate on like about a dozen files at a time. So if somebody reports a, a problem in the output, I have to find out which file in the input it actually was. And, you know, because we do that for a reason, right? Because we want to reuse code, but often, Accessibility audits are very repetitive due to how we reuse our code. So if you have a problem on page one, well, guess what? The next five, 10, 15 pages are gonna have the same problem because I intentionally built it that way. I built it to reuse the code. I, so I built it to have problems on every page because I'm, I only want to write problems once. Accessibility audits are, are often ignorant of easy versus hard in the underlying system. Does anyone know the difference between these two pages? Anyone, anyone? Yeah, it's tough to tell from the outside, right? But this is one of them's on the production database, high level of effort to change. If you have to add like a attribute or something or a, or a field to the database, oh man, that's people come out of the woodworks and security compliance, oh, every, that's a big deal. But if you have like a static site, well, that's a low effort, that's an easy change. You know, one's often, the, the accessibility offer, uh, audits are often ignorant of the metrics and the relative importance of the page. Anyone know the difference between these two pages? Anyone? Anyone? Well, it's really obvious. One gets like a million views a day. It's a very high impact page. And one gets about 5,000 views, maybe a month. It's a very low impact page. You got to think about that. You don't know that. So, th so they're weighted differently a little bit. You know, one example is we had alt text is mission, missing issues. Pretty easy fix, but anyone know the difference between these two pages? Well, again, this one was on the production database, millions of views a day. It will take weeks to fix because we have to make the change. It's got to, that change has to go to the level one staging. That thing has to go to the QA, then that has to run through all the QA, and then it has to go into production, and then it has to pass all the tests. It takes a long time to fix that issue. Um, and then, but the static site, I could take fix it in minutes. I could fix 500 static site issues in the time it would take to fix one production database issue. This is all to say accessibility audits are good, but they have some limitations. So getting back to the original question, how to eat the proverbial elephant. We were having digestive issues. We were not having a good time wrangling our head uh, uh, around how to do this. And so we, we kind of realized like a, a chronological list of issues. Basically, that's what we got from the offshore audit team was, was an, you know, they started on one page and went to the, the end of the, the site and they just filed issues for each page. A chronological list of issues wasn't that really helpful. And the offshore team had, had labeled things high, medium, and low priority, which turned out to be like radically wrong, but that's like, but, but it wasn't so much that it was incorrect. It was that we didn't have any context for how they were weighted or, or gauged. So that was like, it was unclear how these issues were related or how they were weighted. So I, I dug around and I tried to figure out how have people like done this in the past. I searched the blogs. I went to the blogs and there's a, actually a really good post by Steve Klabnik, who's actually speaking in the next session, uh, not in this channel, but in a different channel. Uh, Steve Klabnik was, uh, he works on Rust right now, but he was working on Ruby on Rails at the time in 2012 and 2014. Uh, but Steve, uh, I think was getting involved or just said, I'm, you know, I'm going to go through all these issues. There were 800 issues on the Ruby on Rails board and 800 issues and they would get 25, 30 a day showing up. So how did, did Steve eat the elephant? Well, he went through, he, he basically opened a new tab, clicked all the issues, opened new tabs, and then like read through top to bottom, every single issue, every single comment, and then read it, closed out the window, read it, closed out the window, read it, and went through like all 800 issues. It took him two days to read all 800 issues. And then 
No, he did. Did he start like assigning it? No, that's not what he did. He, he, he read through it again. And so when you like read through it again, you now have like context and you can start building relationships through issues, like, like seeing like, oh, that issue is similar to that issue. And so he was able to do better triaging the second read through because he had now seen like duplicates and, and different things. And he was able to kind of come up with a metric, like, is this a feature request? Oh, okay. We handle those a little bit differently through like RFCs or whatever. Is this a request for help? Oh, that should probably go to Stack Overflow. Okay. So easy, close those out. Uh, is this for an older version of Rails? Okay. If, if like a new version of Rails fixes it, that might help. Does this have repro steps? Uh, if it doesn't like, sorry, can't help you. Like that's basic, basic open source. Uh, can I repro the issue against the head, the, the latest version? If I can't, then maybe it's been fixed, but if it's still a bug that can be reproduced against the head, the latest version of the project, well, then maybe it's an actual bug and he can assign that to the relevant subsystem maintainer. Ah. What a good story. What a good way to break down the whole thing. Uh, but it took two read throughs of all these issues and more issues are showing up each day. So I did this with, with our work and, and I started reading through all the 300 issues and I started seeing similar problems and started making connections and took a few notes here and there. Uh, lots of my issues were for pages that didn't exist anymore. What? How do you get a bug on a page that doesn't exist? I don't know. But that's what happened. And so we, we had issues. And, and so I, it was kind of like, okay, this is, there's clearly some like problems here that I, we maybe need to address. But we were kind of hitting the limitations of Jira, right? Like Jira is great software. Don't want to poo-poo it. Like if you use it, that's great. Uh, but having like 300 issues in the to-do column <laughs> does not, isn't super great. Um, you can switch it to a list view, but that's still like 300 issues in a to-do column. And, and you have to like click into each issue to get more information. And we were kind of like, it was kind of like a, a Goldilocks problem. Like the, the board or the list issue didn't have enough information and the, the detail view had too much information. So we kind of like, we we're having struggle in like processing this information. And maybe you could like, you have Jira foo and, and you can like, uh, write a query, the perfect query that fixes all of this. And like, that's cool. But I did not have either access or <laughs> the skills to do that. Um, we actually found it was easier to pull all the issues down and put them in Excel. Boring, right? But like, this was easier than like the project management tool. Uh, project, you know, I'll just read through these issues. Project one, two, three, missing alt attribute on page. That's a high priority. Uh, one, two, four, focus not visible on hamburger menu, high priority. One, two, five, uh, page is missing alt attribute. That looks like one, two, three, but worded opposite, but whatever, that's a medium priority for some reason. Same issue, but medium. Uh, one, two, six, missing three to one contrast on search. That's a low priority. Okay. Um, and then one, two, seven, focus not visible on checkout. That's a medium priority, but here's the thing. It's medium priority, but here's what I know. Checkout is a very sensitive page. If you start changing checkout, everyone gets mad because that's how they make money. And so if you change checkout, everyone gets mad. And so wouldn't it be nice if we had a little bit more data in our spreadsheet? And this is what we kind of did. We sort of kind of went through and we we're like, what page is being affected, right? Oh, that's for the about page. Uh, okay, missing alt attribute. On the about page, not really a high priority, to be honest, but whatever. <laughs> um, uh, the, the focus not visible is on every page. It's a global issue. Uh, the missing alt attribute uh, is on features. Okay, that's a bit a little more high priority. Uh, and then missing contrast on search, that's uh, all uh, global. And then again, the checkout page. Um, and I just happen to know that features would be like uh, the, the, that would require a database change in that particular instance, but wouldn't it, but we don't build page by page, right? I already said that, like we don't build page by page. We build like component by component or object by object or what, you know, design systems is kind of the work I do. But so which component is affected would be super helpful to me, right? Like, oh, this one is like for the, is an image component. And this one's a header. This is the global header. This is an image component. This is header, but it's also forms. Okay, that really helps me out. And this is just a form on the checkout. Oh, well, that's kind of easy, actually, if it's just a form on the checkout. But again, sensitive. But wouldn't it be great if we knew, like, 
what the problem was <laughs> like if we not just like a general abstraction of like these summaries that don't match like what if we knew the exact problem right and we could maybe add another column for the actual WCAG violation. Actually, I'm sorry, they don't say violation, they say WCAG success criteria because that's positive and violations are negative, but whatever. So it's what violation or sorry, success criteria are we not meeting? Um, Non-text content, that's alt attributes almost always, focus visible, non-text content, non-text contrast. Aha, you gotta read carefully. And then focus visible again. So when we look at this, we start seeing new dimensions, right? And we can add numbers and, and look at this. Like if we had tallies, like it's five issues, but it's only on four pages and it's four pages, but it's three components and it's three components, but it's really only three problems. So either of those, any of those numbers are better than five, like four is better than five, <laughs> three is better than five. Um, all of these are better. So, but the other thing is you can like, and we're hitting the, the limits of Excel now because like you can like sort by a column in Excel, but like you, you can really only visualize one dimension at a time. You can like get into pivot tables, but that's a little weird too in gnarly territory uh, and, and doesn't, it's not a <laughs> great situation. So I started wondering, could we leverage modern spreadsheeting applications? And I'm gonna talk about Notion specifically in this talk. Uh, Airtable is another one. I, I had mixed results, um, full disclosure, I've worked with Airtable in the past, but I had mixed results like doing this workflow specifically in Airtable. And then Code.io is something I learned about recently, but they actually have a workflow for managing your JIRA in their tool. So it would be worth checking out. And they have videos online of how to do this very similar thing. And so like, I actually kind of recommend that one, like, cause it seems very optimized and it, it can actually like sync to a JIRA query. That's kind of cool. Anyway, so I, but I was curious, like, could we use these new tools to kind of experience multiple dimensions at once and build something more helpful like this? So I'm going to walk through the process of creating a multi-dimensional accessibility audit. And for uh, the for this talk, uh, I can't share my client's accessibility audit. Legal was not super happy with that idea. So uh, I'm going to use this thing from WP Campus. Uh, who commissioned an audit from Tenon IO, who's a really reputable accessibility firm uh, for the, uh, they audited the Gutenberg uh, WordPress editor, which is kind of the new editing experience inside WordPress. Uh, and back when this happened, 2018, 2019, there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt around this new editor, uh, like its accessibility. And uh, they just said, you know, let's solve this. Uh, let's, let's commission an audit and see what's actually going on. Um, and, and it was all mixed because Automatic, who owns WordPress, was kind of just like, we're just putting it in anyway. We believe in this. We're betting on this. So it was, a, you know, there's a lot of doubt in the community uh, or uncertainty. And so they commissioned an audit. And the audit is actually best of breed, like, like Tenon did an amazing job. There's a 300 page summary of like detailed how to fix every single problem. There's a, uh, like a whatever 10 page executive summary that you can hand off to your bosses. And then critically, there was like a whole spreadsheet of all the problems, a CSV file of all the problems, which I'm going to use in this talk here. So step one was import the data, right? Uh, so we get a spreadsheet, boring as heck. I'm already bored, but let's just import it into Notion and see what happens. <sighs> I'm like, I'm like already 33% more chill right now, like just looking at this compared to the last one. So this is good, but I can already kind of identify like quite a few repetitive bits, like that that issue key says, get, 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 get. That's not useful to me. So step two is hide some columns. Let's just hide them. So in, in these tools, you can usually like find a column and just say like, oh, you know what? Hide it. I don't want to see it anymore. Or you can go into this bolt thing and start hiding things. Like the project name was just gut, uh, the issue key we don't need. Um, we can go hide, uh, I don't know, like descriptions. You never want a description in a spreadsheet like ever. And then recommended code fixes. Yeah, get rid of that. I don't want to look at that in a spreadsheet. And now we've simplified things quite a bit. 
but you could still see some repetitiveness, right? Like, like there's like seven columns of components. So that tells me there's like a repeating kind of thing. And then the issue type, it looks like there's only one or two types there. So we can kind of start converting these columns to selects and multi-selects, which is the, the vernacular that they use. But you just go in, you click the header of the cell and you just kind of use this drop down to change it to a select, but then columns where there's like repeated columns and you can go and uh, switch it to what's called a multi-select, which kind of allows you to put more than one value in there. And I have to do this manual migration of pulling things over. There may be a way you can like do that in Excel or something like uh, before you import or whatever, but uh, you know, I just kind of went through and I kind of cleaned this all up and then, you know, guess what? I'm done with those columns and I can hide them. Easy. Let's be done. This is this is the best part of my job when I get to hide something in a spreadsheet. Step four, man, it's boring, right? Let's color. Let's get fancy. This is your board. Let's color. Warnings aren't gray. Warnings need to be, I don't know, yellow because of soccer or orange. I don't know. Yellow. And then bugs are red because that's a don't, that's a stop and pay attention to this. Maybe it's green. Maybe it's an emoji. Whatever you want it to be, it can be that. Uh, I, I color coded everything. I color coded all the assistive technologies. I color coded all the WCAG violations. I'm that anal and I'll do that. So after you've color coded your whole board, like made it pretty and fancy how you want it, go through and add counts. So this is what I showed you before, but or we did in the Excel. But once you start counting all these things, you start to get some interesting data. Like, oh, look, for components, there's actually 16 components. And then it's going to be kind of towards the end of the, the thing. But uh, let's see here. The, yeah, the, the WCAG success criteria that we are uh, violating. Uh, there's only 26. So that actually tells me there were 90 issues in this one text editor, but it's only 16 pieces. There's 26 things wrong in 16 components, 26 violations in 16 components. And that's a way easier way for my brain to digest things. And I can start to kind of mind map and build, uh, build some like very interesting associations. So the next thing we want to do is add dimensions. And there's some really cool technology that you can do here. So you can like just go through these views and add a view. So let's get all the, the component, the title block. Let's get all the issues for the title block, just a simple list of components, right? So we'll add a filter. We'll filter by title block. Um, this should be pretty easy. Okay, great, four issues. Next, let's go through uh, group by component. Let's just like group all the issues by component, right? So we'll make a Kanban and board and we'll group by component. Look at this. You can pick and choose whatever component. Maybe Sally worked on the text block component and she can just go through all the text blocks. That, that's all, those are all Sally's. We'll, we'll have to figure that, we'll have to let Sally know, but she's gonna have to work on those. Uh, group by WCAG uh, violation or success by success criteria. Um, you know, this, this is kind of helpful. Oh, I made a table, sorry, but these tools are really forgiving. So you can just like flip it into a board. We'll figure that out. Uh, it's okay. Uh, but you group by success criteria and maybe you can like figure out like, oh, like that's the focus ones are all here. We could maybe fix all these focus ones. And I need a little bit more information there so I could just add another field in. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then like the next one is like group by platform, like what assistive technology is affected by this. And this one's cool because like, look, look, I color coded all the windows ones, but oh, windows high contrast. That's a really actually fun one to work on. And oh, there's Mac voiceover, iOS voiceover. I don't own a Mac. So that'll have to be somebody else who does that work. Uh, group by population. And this one's my favorite. Okay. So we're going to go create a board. And we'll group by the population affected, which is something that Tenon gave us uh, in their audit. But look at this. We now have numbers for the population affected. We can now tell who our application is actively discriminating against. Isn't that great? Does your application know who you're actively discriminating against? Probably not. But look, now we have some data. And for me, the, like, the cognitive impairment one is like the biggest column. And that's actually very interesting to me because for me, I actually struggle with cognitive impairment uh, issues the most because it's sort of, 
you know, it's a mixture of disabilities and in, in, in under that umbrella from, you know, uh, mental retardation to autism to even dyslexia, uh, a lot of issues under that umbrella, but often the fixes required in there is, is kind of big fixes. Like, oh, you put a drop down on that un changes something above it or something like, so your UX is usually bad there. And so that's like a bigger fix than even just like a ad focused states. But with this data, we can actually build something very, very cool and very useful and very, uh, I don't know, very <laughs> inclusive. So wrapping up real quick, we started with this and we ended with this. And we can build out all these different dimensions and visualize our data however we want to. I think that's very powerful. It's very fast. It's very quick. And you just, it's easier than <laughs> like building a Jira query for me. We went from 38 columns to about 10 columns in our spreadsheet. I'm instantly more relaxed. That's literally like, <laughs> like four, whatever, uh, 400% improvement for me. Uh, how did it work out for us is, is maybe the big question. And we were actually able, me and uh, two or three other people were able to actually clear out 142 of the 313 total issues, 46 in about two and a half months with like part-time capacity. No one was on accessibility full-time. We were all doing other stuff, but we, we closed out that many issues. And again, like the biggest one kind of going around in a, a, a clockwise uh, was 50 issues were, were unreproducible. They just literally, the pages didn't exist anymore or they shouldn't exist anymore. Uh, so they just need to be deleted. Uh, the next 19 uh, were contrast issues, which was actually ended up being a problem with the color sampling tool that they used, uh, the offshore team used on the, the uh, site. Uh, 19 or 15 issues for the promo code. I won't read all these, but. We just basically went through and we are able to make some pretty fixes in a dramatic amount, less amount. I was expecting spending two years on this and it was like two and a half months. We got through most things. And then unfortunately my contract ended. So I want to give some thoughts on uh, improving workplace satisfaction via the block, the backlog process. Um, just kind of before we go here, uh, individuals and interactions over process and tools is from the Agile Manifesto. But but I think like the way things have happened is we become kind of, we, we just want to get through the two week sprint, the process and, and clear out the JIRA, the board, the tool. Um, and, and we kind of miss out on some of the humanity, uh, the autonomy of things. You know, Daniel Pink does like some self-help books and stuff, but he kind of has narrowed uh, like that, individuals need like three things, right? Uh, autonomy, taking on what interests you, mastery, feeling of getting better at things, purpose, doing something bigger than yourself. And, uh, you know, when we're kind of just, just burdened by this backlog, it takes a really an emotional toll. And, and often you don't have the autonomy of taking on what interests you. You just have to get through things. Maybe you have like that, but you don't, you know, if you don't have the mastery, if you just keep doing the same five problems over and over, you maybe don't feel like you're growing or gaining mastery. And then purpose is a big one. Like for me, like accessibility issues have a lot of built-in purpose. Like I'm making the world a better place. Uh, and that's very uh, good to me. But if the organization, the entropy of the organization is to undo accessibility work or create more accessibility work, then I don't feel like it has purpose. So I know what you're saying, ah, no backlogs. That's where you were going. Yeah, ideally, but I think like the step is to get to no log jams first. And I, I kind of have like four quick tips. I think that can help get to no log jams. And, and here's what I think you can help get there. Tip one, avoid extensive audits. Like start with a few core templates first. Again, like we reuse code, right? And we replicate problems across our code. So uh, chances are, if you fix one on page one, it'll be, fix on page two, three, and four. So start on, on very small pieces uh, of when auditing things. Jerry McGovern is one of my favorite speakers, but he talks about this idea of top tasks. Like what's the top thing your user has to do? Does it have to add something to cart? Great, let's work on the add to cart flow. Is it, they have to check out because so, that's how we get money? Then yes, let's work on the checkout flow. If they have to sign up, does your your, your application need signups? Then, then make the sign up flow perfect. Just take one piece at a time. 
And chances are like if you're building component by component or whatever, like you'll, you'll fix that. And if your application has like low code reuse, well then like at least somebody learned something and now they have a skill for when it shows up on the next page. Tip number two is deliver issues in small packs of related issues. Um, and this is maybe for accessibility auditors, but really anyone, but, but literally like in a pack that somebody can carry, I use this backpack, like what's, what's like the number of issues that somebody can carry. If you give somebody 313 issues, that's, that's a burden, but you know, have anyone seen anyone with a desktop that looks like this? That's awful. That's it. it gives me the, the, uh, uh, but if it looks like this, well, I'm instantly more calm and cool and collected. And now we have packs of issues. You can fix alt attributes, fix focus states. Oh, modal Sally worked on modals. Those are going to go over to Sally. Sorry, Sally, but the, the but may we'll ask Sally, but those, if we break them into packs, like in your backlog is organized more like this, things are going to make a lot more sense uh, and, and be a lot easier to digest. I think about this, like back when I was a kid, right? Like you get a Lego set and you open the Legos and then boom, like 500 Legos shoot out into the carpet and get stuck in there. Uh, nowadays, when my son opens a Lego set, well, they're all numbered packages. And these packages are awesome because they like progressively, they are basically progressive bundles. Like, oh, you're on phase one of the project. Oh, you're on phase two, phase three, phase four. They're like progressive bundles of pieces. And I think there's a lot of inspiration here of like how you might be able to deliver packs of issues. And kind of getting into the progressive idea here, like gamify the experience by progressively increasing the difficulty. And I don't mean like give people badges for like completing accessibility issues, although that might be cool, but I doubt it. Uh, I mean more like Mario, right? Like World 1-1, one, one, you like just learn how to run right and jump. That's every Mario ever is just learning how to move the character and jump in World 1-1. One, one. World two, you start getting new enemies, you start getting new power-ups and stuff like that. And so it starts getting a little more complex, but then by the last world, world four, you're like having to use all these things in combination. The, the power-ups, the jumping, everything has to work in concert. Uh, you know, and I think we could do that as we kind of build our products, like, like maybe world one is fixing alt attributes. World two, oh, we, that requires collaborating with the designer to fix contrast issues. Same with focus states. I think there's ways to like build these things. You know, I, there's in open source, there's the good first issue hashtag. That's a really good thing too. Like, like these are easy, low hanging fruit to, to do fixes. But my last tip is to care about accessibility before legal shows up. I, like there's no replacement for caring. Same with the security talk we heard in the keynote uh, this morning, you have to build it into the culture. And if people don't care, it's not gonna get done. And you're just gonna have a backlog of accessibility problems because you didn't care about accessibility. So again, I wish you the best uh, on, on getting towards no log jams. I really hope it works out for you. And I wanna give a quick thanks to uh, two of my friends, Yan Wang, who I co-host a video game podcast with, uh, but uh, Jan was sort of a guinea pig for kind of trying out these multidimensional accessibility issue ideas. And then uh, my friend Christopher Schmidt, uh, who passed away earlier this year, uh, he was always an advocate for the things I was doing, always very interested, but he also worked at a, an accessibility consultancy and gave me some feedback on how this fits into their process and how it fits into uh, my process as a developer. So thank you uh, to, to Christopher. And thank you everyone for joining this talk. These are just what an event, uh, so many talks and stuff. So thank you for joining this one. And that is all I have. Take it away, Doug. All right, thank you, Dave. And thank you everyone for attending. I don't see any questions here in the Q and A. Okay, yeah, if you wanna hit me up on Twitter at Davidtron5000 uh, and just ask questions, so yeah. I, I'm there all day.